Hi, Kyle. Welcome to the Genetic Genius. I'm so excited to have you guest today. Hey, Dr. Lulu. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. I know it's early where you are in Australia. So, uh, good morning. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. I'll get up early anyway, so that's that's okay. <laughs> that's wonderful. So, before we dive uh, deep into our conversation today, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself, talk about your story, your role on the planet, and your passions for what you do. <laughs> Yes, that's that. That's quite quite a good, good good bunch of topics. I mean, for me, I I was born in uh, South Africa, Johannesburg. When I was when I was I moved to Australia when I was two, so I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. I grew up for the first few years of my life uh, actually in a pub uh, with, with my with my South African granny. As my mother was a model, she was an international model, so she was traveling around the globe with Vogue, and. Yeah, then eventually my, my mother found her way to Australia and she met an Australian man and he said, you've got to get him over here. Australia's a lot safer. Yeah, and so he, he, they eventually got me over. I lived in Bondi, Australia, which Bondi is pretty, you know, the landmark of, of Australia. Mm -hmm. And I grew up there for a few years, uh, a few years of my life. So I, I basically got assimilated into the Australian way and then <laughs> the, the Australian family and and my grandmother at that time she she saw me walking up the stairs so, so this is my Australian grandmother so this mm -hmm. is my new Australian family that I've got no relation to at all and she said she saw me walking up the stairs you know into her lounge room to meet the, the Australian family and said I had this kind of look on my face like you know who are these strange people you know this isn't my <laughs> this isn't Your my tribe. South African family yeah, yeah this is not my tribe at all you know <laughs> what's going on here so and she said she could see like this, these lost eyes, you know, mm. and this kind of fearful expression. And she said she had this overwhelming feeling in her body that she was going to be really important in my life mm. and like that God was communicating to her and that she was going to be important in my life. And she's 89 and I still call her, you know, as much as I can. And when I speak <laughs> to her, she still, still brings up that story. Oh, <laughs> you know, that's the, so the, sweet. <laughs> yeah. So, and she was, so my grandparents were really, they actually became my parents in a lot mm -hmm. of ways and they raised me. They were there for me in some of the hardest times of my life when I need to discuss important topics, you know, I would go into their room morning and night just to chat with them, have conversations. And to be honest, Lulu, th th those times were bliss, you know, being able to mm -hmm. talk to my grandparents at the drop of a hat and just have long, deep conversations was, was so amazing. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. To have that bond with that generation is just so special. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think at the time they had 178 years of life experience together. And that's a long you know, time. That, it's a long time to be <laughs> yeah. spinning on this planet, you know? Right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. My grandparents died when I was younger. So I didn't have uh, one of my, my, dad's mother died when I was six. So I didn't really have that, you know, intimate relationship Sorry, with yeah. my grandma. Well, you know, it's yeah. just part of the, the process, but so I learned exactly. through stories, which is still yes. really fun and pictures and things like that. But having yeah. the conversation in person is different for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all those moments, they're, they're all tokens, you know, you kind of hang on to them. Like I know mm -hmm. I had like a photograph of my stepdad when I was younger and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, like different sort of things that you, you hold on to as tokens that kind right. of, they bring you close to that person that you can't be in contact with, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important. Yeah. It's so important. I love that. So tell us, so let's move into kind of, so that's a little bit about you and your background and let's move into talking about your kind of concept or philosophy. I like to see this kind of like your philosophy about deciding your own destiny. Cause I think that's kind of like sums up a little bit, uh, just a, <laughs> a glimpse of who you are, but it's It's kind of like the blood that runs through your veins, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, another thing that I do in terms of like services that I provide, I do time capsule videos of elderly people. Mm. And so in that process, and, I, and I've done that, with, I've done that with my grandparents in that process, you're trying to capture so many, like I said, 178 years of life experience, right. you know, into a nice and trying to find out what, you know, for some people, fa families, that's a 20 minute thing. For some families, that's a 10 minute, five mm -hmm. minute, you're trying to create a time capsule. So yeah. yeah, I mean, the more that we can kind of make the information spliced up, impactful, mm -hmm. you know, the better. And I think, yeah, you're right. 
summarize me as decide your destiny. I think that's, <laughs> that's, I'll take that for sure. That, <laughs> though, to be honest, that was not, that was not me or, or, or my message. That was actually my grandfather's, you know, message. So, so one day, you know, when I was 18, I was sitting on the couch in his you know, lovely house that he, he designed as an architect. So he designed his house and he had this big, you know, windows everywhere, glass everywhere. So that mm-hmm. you really invited the outside and nature into your home mm-hmm. and everything seemed a lot larger. So we just sit on the couch and he turned to me, you know, turned his face to me and he, the sun was kissing the side of his face and he just looked in my eyes and he had this big boyish grin <laughs> on his face, you know, and he said to me, decide your destiny. And mm-hmm. I went, what? He said, <laughs> yeah, so typical, typical, you know, teenager. Went, what? Right. Huh? Huh? You know, excuse me? So, you know, but yeah, and it's not that I was on my phone or anything. I was just like, I was just, it was a weird thing. It was like, we were just both sitting there, but without saying anything for, for a couple of minutes. It was mm. just kind of like, you know, a moment of unaware sort of peace that we were just sitting in each other's company. Right. And yeah. And so he said that to me and I said, what do you mean? He goes, just make sure whatever you do in your life that, you decide your destiny. Mm. And I went, wow. Okay. And and for me, obviously, you know, we like to think like, and then that moment I went on my voyage, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, and the journey but, began. <laughs> yeah. And the journey began. I put my cape on and I went out into the world. And <laughs> <laughs> right. But it was just a seed that was planted, it sounds like, and said. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I, Which, you need, I, I think you need a lot of repetitive information at that age. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, also, you know, we have to have the seeds planted to nurture the garden for everything to grow. It's not like, you know, like you said, it's not instantaneous, like even though a lot of us wish it was like that, I think. <laughs> exactly. But sometimes we have to create the, the seeds or you've been on some other journeys too. And we'll talk about those as well. So yeah. in the decide your own destiny, what's kind of like that, that concept that maps out your, your daily life? Cause you're, you're kind of working with that every day. <laughs> yes. Yeah. hundred percent. So I guess for me, what it really comes down to it you know and so, so i do the, the daily vlogs you know just as kind of a it's a way to keep me in check so that i'm not just preaching and saying or you know sharing a message and saying guys go out there do these great things and then i you know i'm sitting in my cave of my apartment and and, and <laughs> not and doing anything <laughs> not doing anything not getting out of my comfort zone not challenging myself you mm-hmm. know so so i think that, you know those videos keep me in check and they, they keep pushing me because i try and take something away from the day and go mm-hmm. where was there an opportunity where i decided my destiny you know mm-hmm. it could be i had a client that i was dealing with and you know which is very rare but this client was you know everything was wrong and i just could not please but i just mm-hmm. made it my goal to make sure that i i did everything that i could do possible right in, you know in my responsibility and and you know eventually this client you know ended up coming back and saying oh can i get more work done so so in that day, and that was a couple of days later, but in that day, I was feeling the frustration, a bit of the boiling <laughs> over the anger, the temper yeah. that I'm sure, you know, yourself and lots of listeners can feel at certain times when right. <laughs> you're, tr- you're trying to please the unpleasable. And so, so I kind of did a, did a just did a, a, a vlog and, and, and said, you know, make sure that you keep your, your energy high your your vibration high while dealing with um, energy suckers or something like that. And that that was the kind of the the topic, you know, I didn't get heavy into the details, but (laughs) I talked around that subject and that was one of the most popular like videos. So I realized, okay, I've got to really draw from the day. Mm -hmm. And for me, for me, it's about getting uncomfortable with yourself every day. And, you know, that doesn't mean go out and run on hot coals or anything like that. (laughs) It just, you know, it just means, you know, not giving in to, the, you know, the, the short dopamine hits that we all want to like, kind of like right. the quick chocolate or the bit of satisfaction here and there, like delaying the satisfaction mm. and really bringing power back to your mind, to your heart and to your soul to make decisions in your day that are going to be better for your day and mm-hmm. better for your future going mm. ahead. Yeah, and that it takes sense. a lot of mental power, right? You know, it does take mm-hmm. a lot of mental power. Yeah. It, it sounds like it takes a lot of awareness each day you know we can kind of be running through the day and not being challenging ourselves. but when we do that then we have more self-growth more awareness yeah exactly Mm -hmm. exactly and like i mean things like meditation right i mean i'm I'm like probably everyone out there like i I, you know when i tried to get into it i was like 
gosh, it feels like an hour. And then look at the clock and it's been three minutes, you know, and you go, wow, this is going to be, it's gonna be a wild ride, this one. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I was just talking yeah. to a, a patient today and, you know, a lot of people, I feel like they don't understand meditation until they really start doing it for themselves. Cause you can't really describe it. It's not like something you can say, yes, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, I feel relaxed or I feel calm. That's very basic, but you know, it's mo- much deeper and um, yes. for, and I see so much change in patients when they're working with their mindset, but especially when they add in that meditation piece, because, you know, it can help with so many different aspects. It's not just the mind, it's the body, it's all of it together roped into one. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And f- for me and my story, one of the biggest things has been maintaining my heart health and really managing mm-hmm. my heart. And, you know, mm-hmm. and so, so, so the great message or the great takeaway from that life experience has been every heartbeat, you know, in every single heartbeat, I mm-hmm. have the decision to make, you know, mm-hmm. I have, and, and, you know, I can, and, you know, I'm as human as everyone, I can kind right. of <laughs> commit to 70% and then say personal relationships, say I just go, oh, yeah, I'm too tired. I can't, you know, and so I can go into that sort of, you know, <laughs> down spiral or mm-hmm. that kind of neglect, you know, of, of the predestined obligation. And by predestined obligation, I talk about is that if I've committed to a relationship, whether it's a family me- member or whether it's my partner or whether it's a friend or whoever it is, mm-hmm. if I've committed to showing up and being a good friend, good family member, good partner, then I need to show up each and every day. And I need to push myself to try and show up hundred percent, hundred percent commitment, not just hundred percent right. commitment in my business or, or, you know, my book or different sort of things. I need to show up in all areas. Mm-hmm. And, and at the same time, you're equally being kind to yourself and realizing that humans are fall- fallible, you know, and <laughs> it's a tough thing, this human thing. And, you know, that's, <laughs> okay, that's okay. But you're also striving to be the best across the board. Mm-hmm. And, and I think things like, for me, it's it's about flipping things. So for me, exercise for me creates energy. So I used to mm-hmm. do the mindset of going, oh, I don't know if I have the energy. You know, right. I, maybe I need to have. You know, when I was younger, oh, I need to have a pre workout, which I highly do not suggest. You know, but oh, you know, I need to have my pre workout <laughs> right. uh, mixture and and concoction. You know, done right in the lab to try or, to get amped up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. and and, and I, what I realized as I got older is it's wow, it's much of this life is a mental game, and mm-hmm. I just started flipping it and going, well, a- actually, exercising creates energy for totally my day. Totally does, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, it's not an energy sucking; it's an energy creating resource. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's like that we can tap into that greater energy source. Yeah, I'm the same way. I have to when I, I love to get up in the morning and exercise. And if I don't have the routine of it, I'm like, oh, I'm too busy today. I'll just do it later. And then if I don't do it later, <laughs> I usually don't end up doing it at all because it's just like so many other things, you know, go into the the bag, the mixed bag of, of, of life, right? But when exactly. I do exercise in the morning, I feel so much different. You know, it's like you feel grounded, feel energized, feel, you know, like a different person for me anyway. And I know that some people can find having that routine of exercise at the beginning, if you haven't been exercising, give me that challenge. And I think that's what you're talking about too. Just like stepping over that like hump (laughs) of like, you know, you don't want it to be a forceful exercise to help your body feel good. You want it to be, you know, a routine where it feel you're getting a reward from it because that's yeah. how you want to continue doing it meditation exercise all that right <laughs> exactly exactly and i think you know you brought up such a great point you know talking with your patients and 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 finding out like when it is for you that's when you're going to commit to it and you're going to continue mm-hmm. to do it you know right. and so really getting clear on that you know writing out you know i like more recently i did a kind of deep dive dive into okay you know what's my story who am i you know why do i make these decisions and really and that's where i find you know, interest, like, you know, going into yourself and being observant, like my my grandfather, he was, you know, an architect, he was very Mm -hmm. observant, you know, and he would sit at the back of the party and kind of, you know, he he wasn't a big drinker, but every time, you know, there'd be a party and there'd be wine passed around, he'd have a glass of wine and he'd sit back at the back of the party and just watch everything and observe everything. (laughs) Yeah. uh And, And you, you know, you'd grow up and you think, okay, this man's, he's a very stoic man. He's very quiet. You know, maybe he doesn't have a lot to say. And then, Towards the end, I was there towards the end of his life. And also, the, you know, the years leading up is that, wow, this person actually is highly intelligent, has a mm. lot to say, has a lot mm. of information. 
but they're just observing life and really right. taking it all in. And mm-hmm. and he was like the happiest person I ever knew because mm. he was taking life in in all of all of its experiences. Right. And you know, I think I think he he definitely knew what knew who he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, he knew what he wanted out of life. And I think once you can get those two things, and I think it comes in that order, you know, really work out who you are and then work out what you want out of life. You know, that's when you can start to pull in the things that are going to be beneficial to your life. Like you said, meditation. I think from mm-hmm. meditation, I started off with a guided meditation. And it was great. It's great to get the training wheels on. But until right. I realized, you know, like, okay, I need to do this for me. Or like, you know, I went, oh, wow, I've had a hectic day. There's so many emotions, so many things going on in this one day. Mm-hmm. I need to go and sit down and just and just sit in quiet. Right. Or, or, oh, I'm, I'm feeling really tired, but I've got to get this project all across the line. And, you know, I had a great, great friend who sent me this, this link of this six-phase meditation. And I mm-hmm. went and listened to the six-phase meditation. And that really, like, oh, 20 minutes later, I just... You know, do the meditation. <laughs> yeah, energized you know? from the meditation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's one thing that I like about meditation too is it can be really inner. It can be calming, especially I like to do meditation at night. But in the morning, it does help to re. You know, it helps you to focus. And one thing yes. you were mentioning before about you know that introspection or deep dive. You know, that's I feel like too. That's how we have that that gratitude for all those things that might be working or not working. And so about exactly. the. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, the deciding your own destiny. So when we choose to embrace that our own destiny, so how can we start to then like you know shift our own individual life to create that destiny? Because I think you know a lot of people have that stuck mindset, especially now. I think as we're in um, a different phase of time, but it's like okay, I feel stuck. I don't know what my destiny even is. <laughs> right? Yeah. So you know, how can we even like decide what our destiny is if we don't even know what the destiny is? So how can we make that first like leap, <laughs> the first jump into getting off the couch <laughs> and into the destiny? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like it's 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 such a big word or such a big I guess idea. And and right. you're right. And what what I often say is like you know the destiny is a destination. You know so uh, so. Yeah you know, what are the preset destinations that you've put up in your life? And then, you know, a lot of people say, you know, like either I'll be successful and happy, you know, once I arrive right. or, you know, mm-hmm. I'm enjoying the journey the whole way through. And mm-hmm. I like to look at it in the middle. I think that you are, you're successful and you're happy as you're going along because you know mm-hmm. where you're going, but mm-hmm. you're constantly arriving at different stages in your life. You know, like right. the five minute meditation turns into 10 minute meditation turns into <laughs> the 20 minute meditation and all these little you know, milestones that you're hitting are you arriving to your destinations, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, like you said, I mean, for me, when I was growing up, I mean, I only had, I had a little brick Nokia phone. I had, you know, the snake game on it. I I didn't have a lot, you know, I didn't have Facebook, didn't have a lot of things, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And I I think life was much more simple, even though it was complex because you're figuring yourself out in those teenage (laughs) years, you know? And we we had a lot of, you know, like our year was in, strangely enough, plagued with quite a bit of death. And, you know, so we mm. had to kind of experience that early on as, as teenagers mm-hmm. and work through that. And so, you know, what I, what I think I was gifted is that I had a lot more time to figure myself out. Mm. And that is a heck of a journey. And that's going to take mm-hmm. a whole lifetime, you know, to really, <laughs> right. to, to really figure yourself out. But I think the sooner you can start working out Oh, I react like this, you know, when I when I don't have enough food, or I get you know, I get a bit grouchy in this situation, mm-hmm. or isn't this funny that that you know that when this happens, I, I move in that direction, you know. So really, mm-hmm. slowly starting to work who work out who you are, mm-hmm. and 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 you know, and and not come from a overarching judgment. If you've done things, right. you know, we, we've all done things in our life that we can look at and go, that's pathetic, or mm-hmm. you know, like. Oh, I wish I didn't do that. Or what was I thinking or, mm-hmm. or, or ashamed of, you know, mm-hmm. I can, I can admit that too. And, right. you know, understanding that there's 8 billion other human beings out there who, <laughs> who, who are feeling the same. It's not just right. you. Not just you, you know? totally. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think that's, that's, I mean, that's the beginning stages. And, and as you keep figuring yourself out and working out who you are and the intricate details of who you are, and then look back on your life and go, okay, what successes have I had so far? you know mm-hmm. and then and then and then start it's kind of like i guess like a, you know you're you're a doctor it's, it can be like <laughs> a, a you know a science experiment as well it's kind of like looking right. back and going mm-hmm. like okay 
what what enabled that success oh that's mm -hmm. right you know i was really passionate about that thing mm -hmm. or i actually really enjoyed playing tennis as a kid and that's why you know i accelerated or whatever it is you kind right. of start putting the puzzle piece, pieces together and you can only do that but you can you can only join the dots by looking back mm -hmm. you know i've heard that one before but I, I think it's really is identifying who you are and mm -hmm. then and then and then slowly by slowly and you know this might be confronting for some people but you start to go into the soul and into your heart mm -hmm. and kind of come away from just the physical because right. if you live a whole life experience just in the physical you know there's going to be times where you need to pull from the heart you need to pull from mm -hmm. the soul right yeah you'll miss out if you just live from the physical for sure because <laughs> it's exactly. a, life is much more in depth than that right or deeper yeah and i like yes. what you were saying about the the destination i was just listening to something this morning about you know, we as humans have this, this expectation where, you know, I only will be happy if I have this X, 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 but the more that we're happy in the moment and we can appreciate and have gratitude for what's going on now, that's how we create more <laughs> of the, exactly. you know, that's how we get to the next step on the roadmap. Because if, if we don't have that, you know, if we're always aiming towards something in the future, it's great to have goals, but if we're not appreciating where we are now, it's like the it's almost like you're hitting the brick wall over and over again for that next destination stop. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, 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 and naturally we have the, you know, negative feedback loops that, that, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, are ingrained in us from, from, from when we were knocking around in caves, you know, so, right. so we have those sorts of, <laughs> you, you know, so we, we, we have that there and, and it's, and it really is, it's kind of like, you know, you've got a mission in your life to retrain, to retrain your, your mindset, retrain your right. brain. And what you're talking about there is, you know, creating those positive feedback loops because mm -hmm. you know, like for me, like if I can get up and I can, you know, kind of walk around and go on my phone a bit and things like that, I won't be very happy. You know, I'll be mm -hmm. going, oh, wait, I'm not being productive when I'm getting up and I'm not doing what I said. I said I would get up and go for a run. Mm -hmm. So then if I get up and I go for a run, I can be happy making that decision. I can be happy on the run. I can be mm -hmm. happy when I complete the run. Right. And I can be happy <laughs> for the rest of the day that I I, I, I did what I said I was going to do. Yeah. So that, that's, I mean, that's, I guess that, that's the thing of arri arriving. You, you're constantly arriving in your life, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the train. It reminds me of the funny, like Harry Potter movie when they, you know, when they're at the train station and they're, yeah. they're not really at the train station. Cause they have to go through what's like, they go through some kind of like magic, right? Nine and, and three they're quarters. The, yeah, yeah. They're like the next one. It's like that. It's like, we're like waiting to find that secret door to the magic train. <laughs> and then we're like, yes. you know, always searching for what's that next, you know, real entrance going to be. And I, and I really liked what you said about, you know, being happy with each step that you're doing. And of course, not, you know, every day is not roses, but if we can, yeah. <laughs> we can take a different positive outlook, then it does change that destination, which is a good, I think, the segue to my next question, which is kind of like, okay, so during our current, you know, pandemic, <laughs> I think a lot of people before have been running on this kind of, you know, autopilot, or I, I like to call it like the zombie world where they're just like focusing, <laughs> you know, running through the things over and over again, social media or anything like that. And so I think now people are shifting into opening up their awareness, especially when it comes to like really focusing on maybe their destiny or what might've been just a dream you know, in there because they're realizing like, oh, I have the time and space now that I'm home more, or my whole life has changed because my job changed. So how does, do you think that shifting that awareness, like can help you to embrace that like passion? Does that make sense? So it's like, if you're, yep. you know, and what tools can people use on that, like in that shift? Cause I think that's really a huge aspect of where we are now with the planet, because so many people are in this state of shift you know and they're like well yeah what do i do and, you know it's a, it's it's fun to be in this fearful state in one aspect you're like oh my gosh i don't know what i'm gonna do i don't this is so new to me but in another aspect you know being able to embrace it does that make sense yeah exactly and i i think you know how you do that is you, you've got to break down some limiting beliefs that you've that you've mm -hmm. either had set in your life you know, by yourself, by your society, by your school, by your, you know, information resources that you've had in your life. I think that's one of the big things. And for me, like you said, recently I had actually just yesterday, I was at a network group, you know, and so I've got different, like you said, like different tribes or different groups of people mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, feed you in different ways, you know, right. like, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so, 
you know, I came from a very uh, soulful coffee like meetup and, you know, kind of deep and, and, and about society and what we can do and how we mm-hmm. can help out. And I kind of went to the, the, the business network and, you know, my kind of limiting belief or my, my, my judgment of, the, of it is that it's going to be, and I had just a, a, a tiny little bit, a bit of a thought going, okay, you know, this is going to be less the soulful, you know, mm, heartwarming, <laughs> yeah, the beating yeah. spiritual. And, you know, one of the ladies got up and said, you know, my, my property um, in another state, someone committed suicide in the property. I need to find someone who can go and clean it, but mm-hmm. also I need to find a spiritual cleanser who can go and clean out the place, mm-hmm. you know, because like, you know, I know people, some tenants are going to want that. And then right. I start chatting to her after the meeting. She goes, you know, I didn't really want to put it out too much, you know, in the meeting, but I'm mm-hmm. very, very spiritual. I'm really into that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. I'm really, and I went, and so, you know, it's so <laughs> interesting, but life or the universe or whatever it is will kind of remind you, hey, 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 don't judge, you know, <laughs> right. find out, you know, be inquisitive. And I think this is definitely an extremely rapidly changing time, you mm-hmm. know, and and I think, you know, two two aspects that can really make you embrace the fear is that realize some things are consistent, you know. Mm, so if right. you have a business, one of the greatest things you can do is contact, is mm-hmm. have contacts and contact your, your clients regularly, contact your old, you know, people that have invested in your business in the past, mm-hmm. you know, contact, you know, so, so there's certain rules that will continue and have continued from, you know, when we were roaming around deserts. So <laughs> I think making sure that, 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 you know, some of the, some, you know, some of the principles that you put in place that, that you go, great, no matter if the world turns into who knows what, you know, a hectagon tomorrow or, or something incredible changes that, that no one thought, you know, you know, saw coming, some principles are going to remain, you know, right. and I think that that's where we talk about universal principles, mm-hmm. you know, like whether we're talking about karma, whether we're talking about, you know, kindness, whether we're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, the lessons that, that kind of come into our life, you know, when we do make judgment, like I just mentioned. So I think understanding those principles is, is a big part of it. And mm-hmm. also the limiting belief that I think I overcame mm-hmm. really was about getting deeper into the heart and soul. And, you know, I had mm. kind of, you know, I, I guess I had more extreme experiences when I was younger mm-hmm. and, you know, literally going into uh, life or death situations, mm. I think makes you look at life totally different. Right. And I talk about characterizing your soul. Mm. So if you think about, okay, if I do everything that I'm predestined to do on this earth, you know, if I really work out what my purpose is, if I try and align that, and I know the, the frustration, like for everyone out there listening, I know the frustration and the, <laughs> the agony of going, you know, all right, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of it. You know, I want to be here, you know, whether it's doing God's work, whether it's doing my work, whether it's doing good work, whatever it is, I want to be here, you know, getting my hands in the clay mm-hmm. now. You right. know, I don't want to be circulating through life. And so for me, I found that oftentimes when I was just sitting with myself and I would ask myself the questions, you mm-hmm. know, and there's, there's so many, I guess, great things out there with you ask seven questions or you ask 30 questions or you, <laughs> you know, you ask the same right. question in seven different ways. Yeah. So I think questions are a lot more powerful than answers, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and really working out, okay, sitting with yourself and go, what do, what, what do I want to do? And for me, what I did is I went, you know, I've experienced like I've experienced death. You know, I've come back from death. I've come, mm-hmm. I've come back from a lot of these sorts of things. I, you know, I, I know what's on the other side. You know, mm-hmm. I held my, my grandfather's hand um, as mm-hmm. he passed from this earth. You know, I know we're all heading to that same destination. That's one <laughs> destination we can't really, you know, turn mm-hmm. off. Although I'm sure some billionaire billionaires will try and find a different way of, of, of avoiding <laughs> right, that. Cryo freezing. <laughs> cryo freezing, or you know, who yeah. who, who knows mm-hmm. what the next technology is? But mm-hmm. but you know, if you're going to live a feel fulfilled life, you understand that what is eternal is my soul, you know? And I think, right. char- you know, building the character of that and, you know, how do you build the character of that? Well, you know, if, if I'm, if I am my word in my life, you know, if I do good things, if I'm kind, if I break out of my comfort zone and go, wow, this might not be a popular thing to talk about or, you know, common society or social norms or the pressures might, mm-hmm. might dislike me or, or put me in a box and a right. label, but is that more important? than saving lives? Is that more important than helping people? Is that more important than being true to myself? Mm-hmm. You know? And I think when you're working with the soul and you're working with the heart, that's where you realize, 
I don't need to have so much social approval at every moment right. of my life. Yeah, I, that's great. And, you know, I, I like what you said about the being in a box, because I think there's so many more when we're talking about this shift on the planet. There's so many more aspects of people that are like have been confined in that box based on the parameters that we have been placing people in, you know, whether yeah. that's culture or race or, you know, whatever. And we're seeing all of that, like, just like breaking, hopefully it's become, you know, I think it's shifting much quick, quick, more quickly than we had anticipated, which is great. You know, it's like, and allowing people to be in that different space creates much more freedom. And I think we're seeing that and people are, like you said, they're, if they want to speak out and be different than they're being encouraged, which I think that helps them create. Cause you know, everybody's we're put on this planet to be individual, not to be, yeah. you know, one blob circulating around the planet, you know, where those would be individual entities still communicating together and connecting, but also in the individuality then creates that destiny. Like you're talking about that, that destiny, that purpose, which then creates this larger sense of purpose. Exactly, exactly. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of people, as you go along, like it's, it's, it is like, you know, what we're talking about, it, it can be beautiful and, and, it's, and, it, and it's exciting and all those sorts of things. And it's also scary, you know, it, mm-hmm. it's also there's, there's, there's repercussions and there's, mm-hmm. there's risks and there's things there, you know, and, and I mean, I know, like, you know, if you think about, it, okay, so, you know, I think when, when in history has it been a good idea to burn books or mm. or delete people or, mm-hmm. or or silence people or shut mm. them down or right. you know go no you don't support my agenda you don't support my my little box of what humanity is right so we're gonna we're gonna get rid of you and mm. for me i think that's such a with the change it's mm-hmm. showing the cards and it's going wow this right. is an issue we've got to kind of yeah. Like look at and, and, and tend to because mm-hmm. this is not humanity, you know, right. like we need to listen to everyone's voice and hear mm-hmm. them because if we're going over here in one end and going, you know, let's, let's get rid of, you know, racism, segregation, mm-hmm. you know, sexism, all the different aspects, right. we can't be going on the other hand, hey, this guy is talking about natural oils. Let's let's clean his books off the shelves. Hey, this guy's <laughs> right. talk, you know, yeah. which is something that is actually <laughs> happening in a bookstore in bookstores in 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 in, in Australia. So wow. you know, so 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 the, and that that particular person is still going and still 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 right. trying to help people and still yeah. doing his mission. So mm-hmm. even though he's having these impacts that that mm-hmm. can be overwhelming and emotional, I think what's important is realizing what's the purpose that's going to make me no matter what, right. keep going and trying to help people yeah. in whatever way I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that can be, like you said, it can be a challenging road. And I think we're all that, that uh, community is becoming stronger in that, in that individuality of purpose, <laughs> if that makes yeah. sense. Like, you know, it's like, we're supporting each other more in that, in that individuality. I, I yeah. it feels that way anyway. So let's shift to the conversation and talk a little bit about heart health, because I know you you've, you briefly kind of mentioned through a conversation about <laughs> your heart health. And so I'd love for you to just kind of talk a little bit more in detail, if you don't mind, and then like how that has impacted you, because I think it's a big part of your um, healing journey. And I think our listeners would really appreciate that conversation. 100%. I mean, I was listening to a, an interview last night about a movie done with Tim Ballard and, and another actor. And it was about, I guess, you know, human trafficking and, and, and mm. kind of bringing awareness about that sort of thing and, and getting out there. And, and the actor that was talking, he was talking about, you know, the surgery that he had in his heart, like mm-hmm. conditions and situations like that. And I was listening to him and I just realized like everyone's heart story and mm-hmm. surgery is different mm-hmm. but you I, I kind of felt connected in a way and i went like wow you know his whole mind his spirituality his purpose on this earth has shifted from many experiences but that experience as well yeah and and i think that's the thing like your our experiences will identify or that they will qualify us in our lives in different ways so mm-hmm. for me you know for this guy the heart would have been one of the many things you know, mm-hmm. for me, right. the heart was one of the biggest things because it was, it mm-hmm. came at that time in my life yeah. and it really identified. And one of the, in terms of a more 
you know, soulful, like, like observing sort of way of looking at the whole experience, I realized, because this is exactly what we were just talking about, I believe that I really started to get sick as I was denying myself from accepting mm, love because I'd right. been hurt so much in my younger years yeah. through abuse. So I kind of denied that mm-hmm. opening Put up a of wall love. around your heart, so to speak. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so for me, if we, like, so going straight into the physical part of it, about two months after I, I left school, you know, I was coming home from a gym session. And at that time mm-hmm. in my life, I was, I was into rugby. I was into, you know, get, getting the beach, getting the beach guns going. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was, you know, so I was coming home from the gym late, late at night and I, and I sat down on the couch and, you know, Independence Day was there. So, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the movie for the, the aliens flying past <laughs> right, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, all that sort of stuff. I went, oh, cool. You know, I, I like this movie, you know, so I sat down, <laughs> sat down for a good little movie before bed. And all of a sudden I got really, really cold. So I just chucked on every bit of clothes I could. I chucked on mm-hmm. um, the, the doona, everything around. So a blanket, sorry, doona is the Australian way of saying blanket. <laughs> <laughs> little little tidbit for you guys there. Right, yeah. um, so I chucked everything on and, and and then all of a sudden I got you know really, really hot. So I took everything mm. off. I took everything off. I stripped down. I was stark naked, mm. you know, watching the Independence Day. And so <laughs> <laughs> that's an important part of the story, of course. Right, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, goodness. So yeah, so I, 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 you know, the next night I went and got ice from the kitchen and then I collapsed on the ground. Oh, and, wow. And, and, you know, this is like on tiles and I just lay there and I was conscious, but I just couldn't physically move my body. Mm. And so I was laying there for probably maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. And then, you know, the next day I, you know, I was vomiting and I, and I said, I, I was telling the people that I was with at the time, I said, I need to go to the hospital. I need to go to the hospital. Yeah, something's so wrong. To, <laughs> yeah, some, I could feel like internally, I was like, something's, you know, not fitting. So they took me up to the doctor and then I, I, I chatted to this doctor, told her what's going on. She said, okay, I think you got gastro take these tablets, you know, j- just take the tablets for a few days. You'll be right. So I went home, drank tablets, vomited straight up. And mm. then, and then after that I was vomiting, but I was, it was coming out both ends. Lulu. Oh, so, wow. Um, you were really graphic. not doing good. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so, so yeah, so it was, it was firing at all cylinders. And uh, <laughs> a couple of days later, you know, my people I was with took me down to my grandmother and said, you know, and, and my grandmother saw me and she said, okay, I'm going to take you to my, your uncle. Mm-hmm. And my uncle uh, was a chiropractor, but he was he had a, had a huge, extensive wealth of knowledge in terms of natural health and mm-hmm. healthcare and different sort of things. And so I walked down the hallway at my uncle's practice, and he looked at me and he said, "Turn this boy around, take him to a doctor. And if the doctor doesn't take him to the hospital, you're taking him to the hospital. This kid's got a virus." Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. He must have seen it in, in me, like at mm-hmm. that time. Yeah. I just remember like having like this dark vignette around my eyes mm. and my peripheral vision was totally like shot. You know, I could mm-hmm. just see people kind of clearly in front of me. So that's how sick I was feeling. Wow. Went to the doctor, this lovely Chinese doctor that, you know, a couple of years earlier I came and saw and he knew I was going through some hard times. So he, he gave me a, a book and mm-hmm. the book was called Hope, titled mm-hmm. Hope. Mm-hmm. And there were messages, quotes in there with beautiful landscapes. So a real caring doctor. And he said, you know, about 10 years earlier, he was in hospital, you know, like working and, you know, applying his trade. And he saw something on the tips of my fingers and he said, you know, you've got red dots on mm. the tips of your fingers. Mm-hmm. And he said, that means you've got a, a virus on your, on your heart. You've got, you know, mm-hmm. some, you know, a bug on your heart. You need to go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Got raised to the hospital. I was sitting down there and I said to my family, I said, look, I can't. I can't excrete, you know, I can't pee or poo, like, you know, I'm really struggling. Right. Nurse came over and looked at my paperwork and said, what the hell, what the hell are you doing down here? You know, you're supposed to go straight through to ICU. Oh, wow. There's been a mistake made. Yeah. You know, the reason you can't excrete is because your organs are shutting down. Yeah. So I went, you know, okay, right. You're like, okay, this is serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, because you've got that peripheral vision and, you know, like kind of, you're so sick. Like, I was just like, oh, okay. Like, so nothing right. really yeah. emotionally, <laughs> nothing I think emotionally like, I was protected. Yeah. It's like nothing computes and you're like, okay, I do yeah. not understand. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Go for it. You know, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was very like the emotion was removed from it. So I, and, and then I, the cardiologist saw me and he said, all right, Kyle, you know, we're about to put this pipe down your throat and you're going to mm-hmm. go to sleep. And, and like I said, I was like, okay. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> right. You're like, so, okay, good night. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that happened. And that, and so this is where the conversation probably takes a, takes a pivot or a turn, you know, depending on 
I guess how open-minded people are. But mm -hmm. for me, my my mother called my 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 stepfather. So this was a stepfather that brought me to Australia originally. Mm -hmm. Called him. He was in Ireland at the time, and she always really trusted him. He was also a chiropractor. You know, he did kinesio like kinesiology. He he had like a lot of natural healthcare, you know, information as well. So she called him um, and said, "This is the situation. This is what's going on." They want to operate. They don't think he'll, he's likely to survive the operation. And they also don't mm. think he's likely to survive the night. Wow. So, yeah. So it's pretty intense. And, yeah. you know, and he made a call over the phone. And, you know, we talked about earlier about seeking and like mm. we're always seeking answers. And I think what he right. does, I've seen him do it a few times, is he kind of, you know, pulls his fingers together mm -hmm. and he, he's kind of seeking information sometimes because I think you know, people are coming to him with like these extreme questions or can you help yeah. me out? And it's, it's a big load. I mean, you know, you know yourself as well. Right. And, <laughs> I'm but, always getting so, questions asked me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and, and I mean, in, sometimes they're in very serious situations and, and, you know, you want to give the right advice. And so I, right. I believed, I believe he asked the ether because I've seen him do that before. I don't know if mm -hmm. he did that night, mm -hmm. but he made the call and he said, I believe, you know, and I'm not there. I'm not, I'm not the doctors. I haven't, I haven't right. done anything, but I believe he's probably too weak to operate on, Yeah. you know, but it's your call. You mm -hmm. need to take everything into account. And so my, you know, my mother chose not to operate and she flew my stepfather over. And so I woke up out of the coma about a week later mm. in Australia, we have, this breakfast called Wheat Bix, which which we we all love. I, I grew up on, on my on my on my Wheat Bix. Um, <laughs> had a bite of it out of the bowl, vomited it straight up on my gown. So oh, I went, gosh. okay, you're like, stuff, okay, stuff. <laughs> not quite back on the track yet. <laughs> no, no, no. And so you know, I was in ICU, and and I was like, okay, this is not how I remember Wheat Bix. And uh, <laughs> so you know, so then my, my my stepfather came over, and he sat with me, and he said, all right, Kyle, this is the situation. You've got a three centimeter bug eating a hole into your heart yeah now they want to operate this is all the information for the operation this is everything you need to know you know if they do operate they're going to cut like a large part of your heart off you're going to have mm. a metal attachment oh, these gosh. are things that you can't do in your life this is yeah. so, so he really informed me and then right. he said and then he informed me of the alternate process so I love when people can inform me and it's mm -hmm. very rare that we can get people to inform us on both sides. I mean, right. that's a yeah, real both thing sides you have to the ask. <laughs> exactly. And, and for all your listeners out there, if the one thing you can ask is, am I being informed on both sides? Right. Or am I just being informed on one side? Right. Or are you being informed at all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge one, Lulu. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, so I had, he said, all right, now this is the natural health way. So there's this thing called the alkaline diet and it's a mm -hmm. fast, it's a juicing fast. And basically what we're doing, the premise of it is that we starve the body of any sugars. Right. And the bug will starve out, it'll drive the bug out. So any mm -hmm. sugars, any protein, you know, so it's basically just juices. And, you know, so he started me off and, you know, he handed me the beetroot juice, had a sip, <laughs> instant regret, you know, and, and I went, God, am I going to do this? But I went, you know, I trust this man. So... So, so I'm going to give this the best shot that I can. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know this. I, you know, I, I don't really believe or, you know, have had experience and reason for me to believe in this, mm. but I trust this man. So let me give it a go. Yeah. So we, the, the cardiologist came in and, and he said, all right, we're going to operate. And we said, hold, you know, hold the bus, hold the bus. <laughs> right now. And Maybe not quite today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, so, so my stepdad was very good at kind of asking the questions and he said, you know, what, you know, what does the bug have to get down to? And we kept asking, him, kept asking him because it was trying, it was basically trying to mine, for, like mine and dig for an answer. And eventually yeah. he said, look, if the bug gets down to 0 0.5 centimeters, then it's a non-issue. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at water and we said, okay, that's the goal. That's the goal. And then the cardiologist left the room in a huff and a puff. And <laughs> then I spent a few more weeks in the hospital. And I guess for me, you know, I grew up, I guess, very naive. You know, I had an idea that every doctor's good. Every policeman's good. Every fireman's good. Yeah, right. everyone's just like, like, you know, I had a sweet view of the world, I guess, when mm -hmm. I was young. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, and I guess, you know, I do understand from their, from their point of view, you know, there, there was this kid that was unwell and they were trying to help with what they knew mm -hmm. um, was the best way to help. And they saw me and, you know, the, the nurses were saying, what do you think you're doing? Taking your own 
life into your hands? What do you think you're doing trying to heal yourself? What do you think you're doing not listening to prof? They were trying to throw my vitamins in the bin because I had a big bag of vitamins. They were wow. so I was it was very shocking for me because I yeah. was like, You're like, this wait a minute, the ideal world. <laughs> yeah, don't I have control of my own body and my own choice? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that was the first time that that was ever, I guess, my reality was ever really mm. shook to wake me up a bit or like to go, right. oh, actually, there's more things going on in the world. You know, there's other people's intentions, there's other mm. people's egos, there's other people's. So, anyway, so I went along and about um, three weeks later, the, the, Cardiologist came back in. And so in that time, I was juicing, I was doing visualization, I yeah. was getting educated on the heart and where, where, where the valves were. I was meditating. My grandmother had a whole bunch of tapes talking about peaks and valleys. So <laughs> I remember a lot about peaks and valleys. And um, <laughs> nice. so, yeah, yeah, so I mean, they were definitely very old school tapes. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, so, it still works. It's still the, you know, <laughs> you gotta, exactly. sometimes you got to go old school. <laughs> yeah, those principles still hold true, you know. So, 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 so I was doing that. And then, you know, I was obviously having the juice, having salad. I had my 19th birthday in hospital and I had, you know, I said, can I have anything? Can I have anything more? And he said, I'll give you a slither, slither of watermelon, you know, like yeah, that's, that's, right. that's your yeah. cake, you know, yeah. like, but, right. <laughs> but we've got a big, a, bit, a bigger job, you know, to, to do. So, right. so I kept going and you know, I, I believed in him. I believed in what we were doing, but I didn't, didn't necessarily believe that you know, it was going to work. And I, and I always talk about, yeah. you know, the only truth that we really have is the truth that we experience, you know? Mm-hmm. And so for me, like, and that, that's the same if you experience uh, deep levels of meditation and right. you know you see different things and, and whatever you, you're experiencing these things and that's why they're true to you so we went on and i three yes yeah, so three weeks later three or four weeks later the cardiologist came in and said all right we're gonna operate and we said, well <laughs> hold the bus you know <laughs> right wait what's, yeah, <laughs> what's yeah. a rush <laughs> what, yeah exactly like what's the what's the what's the you know the 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 figures you know you know, give us the papers give us everything the measurements everything you know because i was yeah. having tests all the time and so you know, he said, look, I've told you guys for a while, you know, that we need to operate and, you know, you've pushed it on and it's very dangerous and you could die at any moment. And, you know, and so, you know, so we looked at the papers and, you know, and we said, well, so, you know, as we were scrambling through papers, I said, well, what's the bug? What's, you know, what's the size of the size? And he goes, you know, it's at 0.2 centimeters. Isn't that, that's what they said you needed to go down to. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Below 0.5 centimeters. So Mm -hmm. we, we like me and Ward like looked at each other and we were like, yes, yeah. Oh my God. And Mm -hmm. he, and he left the room like huffing and puffing and (laughs) cursing a bit. And so, so, but, but we were just like, so amazed, you know? So I was like, wow, like, you know, this actually worked, you know, this, this thing that is not, you know, put into school systems or any sort of reality or on any sort of, you know, normal television or, you know, news station, this, this thing actually works. So, right. <laughs> so I was like, you know, the, the, yeah, this little thing, this information that's, that's, that's a gold mine to find. So I, yes. Yeah, so, so, so a couple of weeks uh, went on and I went, I need to get out of the hospital cause I'm feeling healthy. And if you're in a mm-hmm. hospital and you're healthy, it's like prison. And yeah, so, totally. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I left and, and as I left, I was, I left in a wheelchair and this register, the Somalian register, you know, that I became really good buddies with like me and him mm-hmm. became really good friends the whole time. And he grabbed my shoulder and I, and, and I said, oh, I'm going, man. You know, great meeting you. Great, great to spend time with you. Yeah. I wish you well. And he said, oh, look, you know, I'm here to just deliver a message from Prof. And I said, okay, what's the message? He said, you know, you're going to die within two months. Your lungs are going to be full of blood and you're going to choke to death when you sleep. And wow. I, just, I just started tearing up and I was just like, and the person was pushing me in the wheelchair and I just went and I just waved. I just said, just yeah. get me out of here. Get me the hell oh, out of wow. here. Wow. Just, so, yeah. And look so where you are now. Experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that's quite what happened, right? <laughs> no, no, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, after that experience, you know, there was also like a friendship drama and a few different things. So I was dealing with so many things, you know, and I think this is where family is so important. You know, I was one night I had like a bowl of pasta kind of shoved in my face by someone. And, you know, I was kind of feeling like a inconvenience to people because I was still mm. being looked after. Yeah. You know? And I was going to a new cardiologist now and I was trying to figure things out and that one night I just broke down, you know, cause there were like relationship issues and friendship groups had split off and, and like all these sorts of things. And, and my actual physical, like biological family weren't treating me well. So, mm. so there's all this sort of stuff going on. 
And I just started crying and I was just crying. I was making the, mm. the spaghetti. I was about to eat extra salty. So you know, that wasn't great. <laughs> crying um, into your spaghetti. <laughs> crying into your spaghetti. I mean, that, that's a quote in itself. Yeah. And, um, my younger brother, um, he's eight years younger than me and he was watching TV. And, you know, the emotional intelligence of this man, you know, I think he was about 10 years old at the time. This, this boy, you know, came over and mm-hmm. just grabbed a hold of me, put his arm around me and started rubbing my back and just said, it's going to be all right, Carl. It's going to be all right. Mm. So that's, you know, that's a little message I want to put out there, you know, family yeah. and giving love. And, you know, you might think that a hug or, or something simple is just a small thing, but it's actually, it's an enormous thing, you know, right. at certain times of your life. So for me, after, after the, the hospital, I went, I went and I was speaking to people in Germany about stem cell research, the mm-hmm. technology where it had gone. You know, for valve, it's very hard, you know, because it's like your knee, yeah. you're constantly using it. Right. So, so I kept going through and I kept trying to heal myself, went to a new cardiologist, told him about our experience. He said mm-hmm. he played golf with this, cardi- this cardiologist. Mm-hmm. And then my family started to arc up and because he said, I don't want to hear anything about it. And my mm-hmm. family started to say, this is our experience. He was, and I just said to everyone out of the room, I need, I need one person on my side. Right. So I chose this cardiologist. I went back to him and, you know, I, I, my, what I was looking for was perse- a repaired valve. You know, how do I actually repair the valve? You know, right, saying, exactly. It's very unlikely you're at about a 20, 30% chance of repairing it. Mm-hmm. So, but that's still a percentage. A, <laughs> that's still a percentage, exactly. Yeah. So, and I went away and I, and I worked on it. I kept trying to you know, be healthy. I, I did some sw- light, light swimming because at the moment my mm-hmm. valve was obviously leaking a lot of blood. Yeah. Um, so I had to be very careful. And it was all very time sensitive. You know, I had to work out when do I hit the green light and go right. for surgery. You know, what do I do? Because we were successful in getting rid of the bug on, yeah. the, on the heart valve. But obviously the bug had eaten part of the heart valve. So, you know, we don't know when that was, but so we, you know, I went back to him a few times and and every three months, you know, the percentage would get higher. So he said about 50% chance of repair. And then he said mm. about, and then about a year later, he said, look, you know, your heart's actually recovered remarkably, probably the trauma, it's recovered from the trauma and, mm-hmm. and there's about a 70% chance. So nice. I called Ward in Ireland. I said, you know, what, what do we do? Yeah, and he said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I think it's time we have the operation." So mm-hmm. I went in for the open heart surgery mm-hmm. um, to repair my valve, and I woke up from um, the surgery. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, you know, you obviously know what the surgery entails. And <laughs> I woke up from the surgery, and and I was screaming, and because I was screaming, I was in pain, but yeah. I was also screaming. And this is how my, how focused my mind was on on that that outcome. I was screaming, repair or replacement, repair or replacement, repair or replacement. <laughs> and someone grabbed my hand and, you know, my condolences go out to everyone else that was in the ICU room at the time because someone grabbed my hand and said, it was a repair, car. And so I was going, Fuck. you know, I was, I, was, I was swearing, I was, go- I was losing, my, losing my nut, you know, I was going nuts. So, so, <laughs> so, I, was, so I, was really, I was really celebrating because the surgery was a success. Now, That's the thing great. With, with heart and your, your mindset and whatever you're doing, is that it's management over a long time. It's not necessarily right. one and done. So yeah. you know, the, the, the doctors come over and said, oh, Kyle, you're in heart block, by the way. And I went, oh, you know, what's heart block? And he said, mm-hmm. look, your heart hasn't got back into rhythm. And I was right. like, and I, I remember going, you know, like lecturing the, or like, sorry, I remember asking the cardiologist everything that could go wrong. And I was like, what's this heart block thing? You know? Right, yeah, so, what's that So I was mean? a bit concerned. <laughs> yeah, and he said, oh, look, you know, like probably by the end of the week, you'll be right. And then the end of the week came around, he said, oh, look, we're going to have to have another operation. And I was like, <laughs> so he said, you know, basically what it is, is, you know, we've cut one of those, possibly cut one of those electro signals yeah. that are naked to the human eye. And, you know, and we got to have, we got to put some wires and battery into your chest, you know, so, and put some wires into your heart. So I went, all right, you know, here we go. Another one, got that yeah. one done. Right. Eventually left the hospital. And about six weeks later, I was going for my provisional license to get my, my license. And I was feeling a bit bloated. And the person I was with said, all right, we've got to take you to the cardiologist. And I went, oh, no, I should be right now. And, and luckily enough, they went, no, no, we need to take you to your cardiologist. Mm-hmm. Went to my cardiologist. He said, and he did an echocardiogram on me. And he said, <clears throat> what the hell, Carl? I said, you know, you're hours away from dying. Oh, and I was my like, gosh. Like this shit again? Like, you know, like are you serious? Like, <laughs> What's like, going you know, on? <laughs> what's going on? And he said, like, didn't you see a doctor or a hospital? I said, yes, I went to my, my hospital in my local area mm-hmm. um, uh, a week ago. And they gave me an ECG. And he said, I'm going to sue that place. I'm going to write them a letter. Someone who's come out of open heart surgery needs to have an echocardiogram. Right. So anyone out there you know, listening to have an echocardiogram. <laughs> right. Um, yes. <laughs> which is basically like an ultrasound. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so he, so he, you know, he, he took me to the, to the hospital across the road and they, they filled me up 
I don't know if it was vitamin K or, but they filled me up with like these vitamins um, mm-hmm. in my arms. And then mm-hmm. they went, cause they were gonna, they were gonna do the surgery. And basically what had happened is my, I had pericarditis. So oh, the, yeah. the sac your heart sits in the pericardium had filled up with blood. Right. And so this surgery I was gonna be awake for. And, <laughs> but, I, but I knew what was happening. So, so I kind of, you know, I had the trailer, you know, I knew what was coming. <laughs> And so I had my head turned to the far left, so I couldn't see it was going to go down. And then the surgeon came over and said, oh, Carl, you know, are you okay? And I turned to him and then I saw this 20 centimetre needle. I just went, <laughs> I said, can I get some more morphine? Right, and then I he looked want to over see the that. nurse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and when I said, can I have more morphine? He looked over the nurse and the nurse kind of did an eyebrow raise, like, well, we've got to be careful. We've got to watch this one. He's, he's keen right. on the morphine. I was like, oh. no, that freaking needle is gigantic. You know, yeah. help a brother out. <laughs> right, yeah, that's that's a, it, very scary to see that needle coming towards your chest when you're awake, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so they stick that into your heart and they pull out the blood and then they pulled out two liters of blood. And wow. the nurses were holding these sacks of blood. Yeah. And I was just like, right, okay, that's a two liter milk carton of blood. <laughs> yeah, you're like, things were not going well. So, but no. so to make a, to, in the end outcome, you've had several surgeries and now your heart is working well and you're in, you're in, in the green zone now? I, I, yes, I definitely say I'm in the green zone. I said, you know, so like, you know, with it being heart management, you know, like, so, so I eventually had to have a third wire put in because my heart went into AF, atrial fibrillation. And, you know, I guess like, you know, there were a couple of those complications. And so, right. so before all that, you know, I went and when I guess COVID hit and mm-hmm. well, I mean, when the virus hit and, and I had family tell me, are you going to be okay? Like, you know, are you, like, right. you know, you're going to be like worried about my heart and everything. And so I took that as well, time to boost my immune system and yeah, time to do right. everything I can do. Exactly. You know, I, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I had the information that I that I healed myself naturally earlier, so I went, let's let's give this another run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and and so 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 I went on that program again. I went running every single morning. I went and I basically what I had done to get to the I guess the end outcome of my heart is that. I took my ejection fraction from mm-hmm. 35%, 34%, and it didn't move for about, you know, like a good seven years. Yeah. And obviously, you know, when you get around to 20% and lower, it's touch and go. Right. So, so which basically the ejection fraction, I mean, you know, is, is how well your heart is pumping. So yep. for me, I, I, you know, I, I went, up, that was my number. I was like, I need to improve that number. Yeah. And for normal people's hearts, it's 55 to 65 um, sort of percentage. So I, mean, I need to improve that number because that number hasn't changed. And that's the one number they always look to. Mm-hmm. And I went running every single morning, meditation, juicing, visualization, being kind to myself in the day, you know, being calm with myself and also mm-hmm. finding that purpose that I could put my energy into. So I, all those things combined for about <laughs> a four month period, six month yeah. period, the great book by David Goggins can't hurt me, help me out as well. Help, mm-hmm. help me to get, get up and running, nice. um, literally get up and running. <laughs> and then, then I went back to the electro surgeon and he, he did the echo and he sat there baffled. He went, I don't, I don't do? understand. <laughs> yeah. Like he goes, I don't understand. Um, he goes, yeah. And so he said, your ejection fractions up now at 49%. Awesome. So, <laughs> so I was like, what the hell you can actually, yeah. <laughs> when you look at the, I can impact life. It's like, Oh my right. God. I yeah. Can. You can change you know? things when you have the mindset and the tools. It's so true. You just have to have the yeah. motivation and the ability to want to really do it. And I think you've definitely had the motivation. <laughs> yeah. And the belief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the belief totally. So was this, this whole kind of aspect of what happened to you when you were younger, part of the inspiration for your new book that that's out and tell us a little bit about the book and what's it about the concept behind your book and the title. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. So, so, you know, having that wisdom passed from my grandparents and, and they were the people that, you know, when things were going on all through that time is that there were, it's not just one thing, like look after the heart, <laughs> you know, you've got family right. structures, you've got lots of relationships, you've got different sort of things that, that are impacting in, in the background, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of background noise. So my grandparents were the only people that took me to the hospital. You know, I said, you guys are the only people. You're... So I trusted so much in them. Mm. And from them, from from them believing in me, you know, I think I've been able to come to this sort of certain point. And, and the, the premise behind the book is that, you know, like, and the premise of me telling my story and, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of for years, you know, to be honest, Lulu, I was worried about 
talking about this because I realized when I spoke to my friends, some friends went, yeah, I know you healed yourself naturally. Like, that's incredible. I was there. And other friends went, I don't really believe it. Mm. And, and, you know, 70% of my family at the time went, you know, what are you doing? You need to go the direct medical route. You know, who do you think yeah. you are? Like, you know, you, like, you know, this is ridiculous, you know, like, and, and really making me feel as though I was being irresponsible, which I understand right. I was taking a big risk. Right. But, but it's your but, life. <laughs> yeah. But it's my yeah. life, you know, right. and it wasn't, wasn't quite, <laughs> you know, obvious to me that it was my life to decide at that time. Yeah. Know? And, and I had to have people in my life that, that believed in me. And that so- supported you, right. Because you were making some difficult decisions for sure. Exactly, exactly. Very difficult decision and risks that most people won't make or, or you know, or, or can't make or, yes. Yeah, so, so, so for me, you know, I didn't feel comfortable talking about that at that time. You know, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, am I the only one or are there many other people <laughs> right. that like- I don't, I know, can't hear this. People are gonna think I'm crazy, that kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, not to take away from other minorities, but I kind of felt like a minority mm -hmm. in the social, you know, experiment in the social world. You know, I kind right. of felt like a, a very minimal sort of, you know, like a minority group that, that would not be accepted socially. Right. Yeah. So I, I understood it from that, that premise. So then obviously, this year comes around and, and uh, the last few years and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there with myself and I'm asking myself, you know, I've experienced near death experience. You know, I've had all these things. Mm -hmm. What can I do that is going to be the work that I was sent here to do? You know, what mm -hmm. can I do to that, that, you know, that's really good. You know, I love, I love my business, my photography business. I mm -hmm. love doing the video journals of, of elderly people. I love those things, but, but what is, what's the work that I'm supposed to be doing? You know, right. because I want to help people. I want to help people. What do I do? You know, and so inspire, you know, inspire generations mm. came through and, and, and this book came through mm -hmm. and the book, you know, really is the purpose of it is obviously like a launching pad for me to go into that space of, of helping people, inspiring youth and, and covering, covering issues that aren't talked about because Lulu, you know, we'll hear a lot about certain issues, you know, on the TV in Australia, but you know, I had to dig and dig and dig and find a podcast mm -hmm. for a lady who was talking about, well, the leading cause of death in, in Australia is cardiac arrest mm -hmm. and cardiac arrest. The recovery percentage is only 6% in Australia, mm -hmm. where it's 62% in Seattle, mm -hmm. in the United States, because we don't have, you know, defibrillators right. you know, around our communities, yeah. like other communities. So, so, and I'm going, well, this is kind of strange. Why isn't this on the TV? Yeah, Why well, you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, and then also there's a huge pandemic of like, or there's a huge issue here of mental health that people don't mm. talk about. Suicide, you know, 76% yeah. of suicides uh, are men, you know, like, well, okay, that's another issue we need to tackle. Yeah, totally. So, you know, like, so with these, with a lot of these issues, which are contrary or unpopular or not spoken about, kind of like mm -hmm. what, you know, Tim Ballard, what he's doing and, and, you know, with human trafficking and, 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 and his sort of mission. So yeah, I think for me, the, the book is really about actually helping people, mm. you know, not doing a tweet or a post and a kind of a thing right. like, I love, you know, this sector of humanity and mm -hmm. go you guys. And look, I'm, I'm all for champion and, and doing <laughs> right. those sorts of things, but, but cheerleader. I, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and look, and that's great, you know, to show you this for, but, but I was really about the tactile, you know, what's the tactile thing that I can do right. to actually to really change lives and help people. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the premise of the book. I mean, I was inspired by my grandparents and they, they invested in me mm -hmm. and also the other heroes, my stepdad. So you know, and those sorts of people invested in me, my South African granny who invested in me from a young age and all these people invested in my life and believed yeah. in me, you know, and I had family um, in South Africa that were murdered. My, my older brother, I had, you know, different sort of things go on during my teenage years. And that's where I really started shutting down and blocking myself off. Right. So decide your destiny is really opening yourself up, be authentic, be vulnerable, mm. be okay with that. Find your tribe mm. that's going to support you, your community because what happens when you start showing yourself out, you start yeah. getting sick. Physically. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you don't have that community that can be that loving, supportive community, right? When we're all closed in more inward and inward. And that's what, you know, that's interesting about exactly. the pandemic too, is we have in one way, we've all been shifted 
to go inward, but in the other aspect, it's created a different type of community because we haven't had that same, you know, relationship. Yeah. It's been a really interesting introspective that I think a lot of people have taken. And now people are being, you know, here anyway, are being able to be more social, a little bit more social, but still they have a guard up, which, you know, it's a very different. So I hopefully that will shift, but your book sounds amazing. Um, I can't wait to read it. And where yes, can people, yeah, where can um, people find out about your book? Yeah. So if you go to kylespreedies.com, mm -hmm. um, that's where, that's where I'm uh, selling the book. And also there's other channels. I mean, YouTube, Kyle Spreedies is where I kind of do the daily destiny doses yeah. and kind of keep, keep going with that. So then, you know, the, the book's up there and I'm on an Instagram and Facebook as Kyle Spreedies. So, and so, I'll put that um, all in the show notes. So everybody knows how to, <laughs> to find you with your spelling of your last name, which is a different than, tricky one. <laughs> yeah, tricky one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll have all that there for the listeners, which will be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, Thank wonderful. You. It's been such a joy to have you on the show. I loved our conversation and I can't wait for everyone to hear about it and to hear your story and to read your book. Me too, Lulu. Thank you very much for having me on. And I think just one thing I wanted to add is that yeah, yeah. when you spoke about finding different ways of you know people being social, I think in a ph yeah. philosophical you know, you know idea of that or, or a comment on that is that we will always find a way, you know, humanity will right. always find a way to be <laughs> yes. social, mm -hmm. we'll find a way to survive, we'll find a way to thrive, we'll find a way to help out, to um, save the planet, save, you know, children, exactly. save people with heart disease, you know, we'll always find a way. And I think what it takes is for you to open yourself up to it, to totally. open yourself up to it. Yeah, you know, we've seen it interesting, because we had seen that closing kind of like where people are more isolated but then it actually opened up because people have been much more global you know i think yeah. and so that i think is that you know there's always both like you said earlier both sides of information both sides of the coin and that's like i've been looking at all the positive aspects of what's been going yes. on the past like 15 months and yeah that's a huge one you know we have seen such a change exactly. in the way people communicate and we'll we're going to continue to see that too and hopefully we'll open yes. up people's minds even more. <laughs> Yay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kyle. Have a wonderful rest of your day in Australia. <laughs> Thanks again. I will. Thank you. And you too. And thanks for having me on, Lulu. You're so welcome.